Hello, world singers. My name is Tyler. And my name is Brooke. And this is Cosmere Conversations. Conversations. Welcome back, everyone. So good to have all of you here because now is the real nerd time. It's finally happened. We can go completely into the depths, way beyond what is normal, and get super nerdy about not just the Stormlight Archive, but all of the Cosmere. Here we go. We wanted to start off with some news that you may or may not have caught. Whenever you are in time, this is brand new information to us, because Brandon did a spoilerific live stream in honor of Rhythm of War, and also it is his birthday, or Kolos Head Munching Day, and that is also the day that the state of the Sanderson is released. So we had a bunch of Brandon-centric information coming out over the last couple of days. We thought we would share some of the biggest bits of information with you here. Brooke, do you want to start us off with something that we had heavily speculated about just episodes ago yes absolutely as i was reading rhythm of war and uh hoid made a reference to the dragon that exists on rashar i got very excited as i was reading i was like yes totally thought that my theory had been confirmed that cherry cherry is a dragon and then brandon just dashed all of my hopes and pride (laughs) in myself Because Chiri Chiri is not a dragon. Chiri Chiri is not the dragon on Rishar. It is, in fact, drumroll please, cultivation. Cultivation. Or rather, the vessel holding cultivation. Yes. And this just throws so many things up in the air because we have been talking about cultivation almost like the power more than the actual vessel because we know very little we, about the vessel yeah don't really know anything about her but we know Except th- that she's a dragon now yes we know she's <laughs> a dragon we know that she had a relationship with honor so yes. there is no confirmation that the vessel tanavast was a dragon i, don't I believe, believe yeah tanavast is a man and so slash was a man yeah there you go you got some uh fun interspecies i don't know what dragons are interspecies like interspecies romance yeah It's going on in the Cosmere. What else did we find out? A user asked, did Radiants who broke their oaths before the Recreants create dead eyes? Brandon said no. Hard no. And then no other information. This was a recurring trend. There were lots (laughs) of just yes or no questions. Yes, no, or Or, Raffo. (laughs) Exactly. Those are your options when getting spoilers from Brandon. This to me... Is interesting because of how much the Dead Eyes and Maya's moment in Rhythm of War and the clarity that we now have that this was a choice. And maybe part of that choice was actually becoming a Dead Eye, where other Radiants well, who broke their oaths would not have necessarily. She says that they didn't know really exactly what was going to happen. But I think that. Rhythm of War as a whole shone a lot of light on the happenings of Rashar in between the heralds sticking their swords in the stone and walking away, and then where we pick up later on with Dalinar. There's like so many years of history in between those that we don't really know a whole lot about, but we've started to get a lot more information about, for example, what was happening to the singers in that time with Ba'ado Mishram, and then also this insight into the recreants. And I think, at least I know, I tend to sort of forget about all those years in between because we don't have anything written really about them, right? At the beginning of Way of Kings, we have the prologue that explains the breaking of the Oath Pact. And then 
we pick up with the characters later. But all that space is a big old question mark. And on a completely smaller question mark, but one that did generate a lot of interest and intrigue, we have this question. Who was the owner of the red chicken? Red chicken that's now in the possession of Lyft, but who was its original owner who Marais killed? Brandon's answer, quote, the Farukamist who was keeping an eye on Dalinar from within his own house, end quote. There was a secret Farukamist hanging out in Urethiru, and Marais knew that and then killed that person. There are a lot of... Secret. Yes. World hoppers. Yeah. yeah. We're going to do a whole episode on all of the world hoppers that we find uh, in Rhythm of War. But this was an interesting, I think the keeping an eye on Dalinar was the most like, ooh, interesting. Yeah. I mean, if he is a bondsmith with the also added weirdness of holding some of Honor's power then he's like a really unique character, even in a Cosmere filled with magic users. I think he would be the one, well, at least until we have Navani, he was the only Bondsmith, maybe the only person capable of doing something that this Farukamis or maybe Harmony was interested in. I don't know who, yeah, how the Farukamis got there, obviously. It's just like a question of like what their motives mm -hmm. are. And we certainly have lots of theories about the off-worlders and the world hoppers and their motives. We'll save that for many episodes in the future. We've talked a little bit about Kaladin swearing the fourth ideal in this book. And on the live stream, someone asked, is the fourth ideal for Windrunners about forgiving yourself? They did also reference Teft, who was close to swearing the fourth ideal and was kind of flirting with a similar concept. Brandon confirmed. He said, yes, for Kaladin and Teft, there is variation possible between the individuals. But overall, yeah, the fourth ideal for Windrunners is about forgiving yourself, your past actions. And I feel like that is clearly a theme that is present in many characters throughout the Stormlight Archive, how they behaved in the past, how they are different now in the present, or how they will be different in the future. And the allowance of flexibility within a theme is something I really enjoy. Yeah, it's not a hard and fast rule mm -hmm. because each the person is- The acknowledgement that like, it's not gonna be exactly the same mm -hmm. for everyone. Like we see in Dawn Shard with Lopin, swearing his third ideal, it's a little bit different than the other knights that we've seen. And I think that's really cool. Probably the most asked question or one of the most asked question, when is there going to be a Stormlight movie, TV show, anime? Why is there not more Stormlight in the universe, basically? And Brandon did give a very complex answer to this one. Yeah, he talked a lot about this theme. So if you want it's also in written form lots of these kind of uh more real world questions or like what's going on with this movie or tv show or book or game or whatever he handles that a lot in the state of the sanderson but on the note of a stormlight specific movie or tv show not going to happen for a while one unlike all of his other works stormlight is owned by someone else and they hold those rights and will for the foreseeable future Brandon has said that he wants to do television for the Stormlight Archive, but that comes with a huge investment from someone uh, because the cost of doing something like a fantasy world, it is also an alien world where basically everything needs to be created by artists. So and much magic, all the spren. Exactly, all the spren. Uh, he's basically pitched it multiple times as a story and TV producers or network people they're always like we'd love to it's way too expensive we can't but he did give a little shout out to one of the most popular tv shows right now which is the mandalorian and without going deep into the technical side of what's going on in the mandalorian they basically have developed a way to shoot a set that they you know build like a traditional set so it could be an alien world 
as it is in the Star Wars universe and as it would be in the Cosmere universe. And they can keep that design space really small. And then they use like a sphere of TVs, really, really powerful and detailed TVs to project the world around them. And you get this really cool effect where like the lighting is perfect because it's actually like you're there. You're not uh, you're not faking it in a way or like painting a background. If you paint a background of a beautiful sunset, it just looks orange, but it doesn't actually give off orange light. Here, you could do things like have spren zipping around in the background and they would each be glowing and that would all reflect onto our characters' faces and stuff like that. So with new technology, it's always possible to do cooler and cooler stuff. Hopefully that happens in the future. I would say... All of this stuff, if you are interested, check out the State of the Sanderson. Speaking of State of the Sanderson, other projects that we got a little update on. Sanderson is really hoping to write a rock novella that will pick up, uh, I believe he said, after the events of Rhythm of War, sort of in between book four and five, like Dawn Chart is in between three and four. That would be super cool to read. I'm very excited about that. And then for the next year or so, we are looking at Skyward Book 3. That is not a Cosmere series, but it is excellent. So if you're looking for something else to read um, outside of the Cosmere, highly recommend that series. We will also hopefully be getting uh, Wax and Wayne for next fall. So fall 2021. Then he will start working on Stormlight Archive 5 and in I, 2022. I'm hopeful about this, everyone. I'm hopeful about this because he did sound very enthusiastic about Stormlight Archive 5 and wanting to get that done. Every other book has taken three years. So we would expect another three years. But I'm actually hopeful that if he, uh, you know, burns through the Wax and Wayne series, gets that one done in 2021, that he can just jump right into Stormlight. Maybe we'll have it by 2022. <laughs> That's very hopeful it's thinking. Super, it's, no. The most likely thing is three years. Keep that in mind. He has a lot of projects on his plate. And uh, although I was happy-ish to hear that with the state of the world in 2020, he has been more productive than he may have been otherwise. So, you know, there's uh, silver linings to this year. We are going to leave you with this, which is just his things I also hope to want to do one day. And there's just an A incredible list. A lot of gems. Adamant. An untitled Threnody novel. The Six of the Dust sequel. Can't wait for that. Also, an untitled Emperor's Soul sequel. I can't wait for that. The Silence Divine. Do we know what that is? No. A secret standalone Cosmere book. The wacky young adult Cosmere book with magic kites. A book called Kingmaker. A first of the sun young adult novel not involving Sixth of the Dusk. Awesome. And Aether of Night. That's a sweet list. And those are just side projects. Like there are clearly also the main works, but these are just the things he does when he gets bored. <laughs> uh, I don't think bored, but like when he wants a break from other things, you know, he just writes new books. An incredibly impressive human being. Let's take all of that, wrap a nice little bow on it, and then dive in to the nature of light. Here we go. We are just diving straight into probably the biggest, most significant aspect of Rhythm of War and the thing that gives it its title. Yes, clearly. This is like the moment when you have uh, identified the title being said in the book or the TV show or whatever you're watching, they're just like, ah, Rhythm of War. That's there it. it. Is. <laughs> <laughs> so we now know that there are three main types of light on Rashar. This is a reveal. Previously, we've really only been dealing with stormlight and then dabbled in void light a little bit. And secretly, we were getting more life light than we thought, but it was disguised by lift. 
and her weirdness. Yes. So there are three. Stormlight, which comes from Honor's power. Lifelight, coming from Cultivation's power. And Voidlight, coming from Odium's power. Of course, one of the key aspects of the rhythm of war is that there are also tones associated with each of these shards. They are called the pure tones of Rashar, and there are corresponding ones. Honor has a pure tone. Cultivation has a pure tone. Odium also has a pure tone, you know, to the surprise of some of the characters. How could the, how could the interloper have a pure tone of Rashar? We'll talk way more about how the tones and the shards interact. Yeah, there's a lot of interacting elements to this. So I do think it can get a little uh, complicated or Mm -hmm. like confusing about what exactly is happening. And we don't have all of the answers yet. But we do learn through, of course, our scholar Navani with help from scholar Raboniel. We learn some of the properties of light. And let's take a small moment to recognize that Navani is the main character of this story. That's our (laughs) opinion after reading Rhythm of War. And on the second read through, it's even more obvious to me. I know that this is like, quote unquote, Eshenai's book that has been taken over by Venli, but really both of them have been taken over by Navani. (laughs) That's how we feel. And it really comes down to this. The most important thing that we thought came from Rhythm of War was this discovery of light, of the tones, how those work together, and then how that impacted Rashar's past, how it could impact its future. And the person who was doing that and was our our lens into that world is Navani. I mean, she is the first thing that we read about. She is the star or the perspective of the prologue. And we will follow her throughout. She is making these huge discoveries about the very nature of their reality, maybe the very nature of our reality. But let's talk specifically about these properties that she and, yes, Rabani L and other people were also working. But Navani makes these discoveries about the properties of light. What's the first one? Capital L light is something similar to a gas. It's also similar to a liquid, but it is not either one of those. And it is differentiated from lowercase light. Almost always in this podcast, we're going to be talking about capital L light. (laughs) And I know that you can't read that. And so it's hard to... uh, pick up the differences, but storm light, life light, void light, the invested light is our capital L light. Right. So it is not the same thing as the regular light that is coming from their sun, for example. And we know that it's not the same because capital L light is the only light that can be captured in gemstones. Those are not uh, replenished by sunlight. And conceivably would not be replenished by anything else. For example, we know electric light exists elsewhere in the Cosmere. Yeah, this is a totally different, completely different thing. Yeah, and I just think of it as it gets the capital L when it is invested. And it's got some, you know, it's carrying around that investiture. Capital L light emits regular light because it is allowing the spiritual realm to shine through into the physical realm. So I think of this similar to when in Elantris, Rayodin is writing the Aeons. It sort of creates a path for uh, the spiritual realm to enter the physical realm. Light is doing a similar thing through wavelengths, essentially, which can be either a wavelength of light or a wavelength of sound which, again, we'll get into in a a sec. And this is where we both wish that we were far better versed in the physics of the real world. 100. I actually really appreciated this book because it kind of explained some physics concept in a way that my very 
not physics oriented brain could somewhat understand. I still had to read those passages many times <laughs> because that's just not the way my brain works. In all of the ways that I am like Navani, that is not one of them. I think that one thing that's cool about these books is that it actually does teach you something about the regular world. In probably one of the most iconic scenes, because it has this very this experience that maybe you yourself would have seen demonstrated. It certainly, you know, was one of those high school physics types of experiments. I think even younger than that. Yeah, it's like a childhood thing. Yeah. You are first exposed to a prism and what a prism can do to light is always magical in a way because it is taking this kind of to our eye, invisible, but that's only because we're dumb. It's taking that and then separating it out and showing you all of this vast color that we a find rainbow. so yeah, just so find attractive and is so wondrous to our mind and our imagination. And the key discovery that Navani makes is that by using a prism, you can identify the specific differences in kind of like the physics of what is behind these different capital L lights. Especially because the differences in them that are perceivable to the naked human eye on Rishar are quite small. Like for, we'll talk about highlight hybrid lights in a second, but the differences between stormlight and life light and tower light are quite um, fine where... Mm -hmm. Like, Navani really has to look hard at a sphere to see if the light looks slightly blue-tinged or slightly green-tinged. But with this prism, it becomes very easy to see the differences between them. So regular light splits, you know, normally like we would expect into a rainbow. With even... Roji Biv. Yeah, exactly. All the uh, colors evenly spaced. Invested light splits with larger bands of specific colors so that stormlight has a larger band of blue life light has a larger band of green and void light has just like a huge gigantic uh purple section that she says almost like eclipses any Everything other else, color yeah. in that quote unquote rainbow the final test that Navani does is by introducing a second prism, which normally, when you're just using regular light, would recombine the rainbow back into a single beam. But when that experiment is done with hybrid light, the result is actually two split unique rainbows that then cannot be recombined with another prism. It's like the capital L lights that were combined split out into their own rainbows and then without something, and this is the, you know, the key uh, question that is introduced by this experiment, but without something, you cannot recombine those separate bands. It is a series of very important discoveries that Navani makes because it will just introduce the basic concepts that will be like kicking around her brain until her eventual discovery of combined light and the rhythm of war that calls it forth. <laughs> Another property of light, as we have alluded to, is that each type of light has its own unique tone and rhythm. And quote, each light has a rhythm. Honors is stately, cultivations is stark and staccato, but builds. And odiums? Chaos, she said, but with a certain strange logic to it. The longer you listen, the more sense it makes. End quote. And that is from Raboniel. Not from Raboniel, but from Venley we learned that void light is replenished or can be created by singing the song of prayer. This is, you know, key difference for how stormlight is so naturally recharged by the high storms or that Dalinar provides as a bondsmith and kind of opening up the spiritual realm. I think that this 
these kind of dual discoveries. A, that each of the light has a tone and a rhythm, and specifically that the singers have a way of recharging their void light through sound and one of their rhythms that they can attune to. This is all kind of the important bits. It gets back to this concept that we keep bringing up that like Venli is not the main character and Navani is. Why Venli is important is, and why uh, Rabaniel is important, is so that we can have this dynamic and this interplay back and forth because you realize things that the singers are doing naturally and instinctively in regards to the rhythms and the tones of Rashar are kind of what everyone else is copying. Let's go back to Rabaniel and the connection between tones and rhythms and the lights. Yeah, Rabaniel reveals that there is already a hybrid light in existence, which is tower light, the light of the tower. Quote, two tones, Rabaniel said, opening her eyes and setting down the stormlight sphere. But they aren't simply the tones of cultivation and honor. They are different, changed, so that they're in harmony with one another. Curious, Navani said. And is there a rhythm to it? Yes, Rabaniel said. Both tones adopt it, harmonizing as they play the same rhythm, a symphony combining honor's control and cultivation's ever-building majesty. End quote. And so, again, she's talking there about tower light, the combination between stormlight and life light and this of course then brings up all of the different aspects opens a whole yeah, new exactly. can of worms like we've just learned that life light even exists and then they're like oh by the way you can also put them together and it's a whole different thing this of course most closely reflects or mimics some of the powers that we see on scadrial under the umbrella title of the metallic arts, we have those three different metal-based powers. Here are capital L lights. We again have three of them, and they can all be combined in different ways. The most important combination, of course, being war light and the associated rhythm of war that goes along with it. Dun, dun, dun! Warlight is stormlight and void light mixed together and is described as, quote, something that surged in brilliant raging storms, then fell still, peaceful and quiet between, end quote. It has a blue blackish color. Keep in mind that this is faint and not maybe as drastic as our my imagination would at least first paint these as all like brilliantly blue and yeah. <laughs> uh, you know emerald green but it is a faint difference and that color that we see is also another important aspect i can't remember if it's vasher but someone basically says color is what spren feed off of oh yeah i think it is vasher and of course vasher's connection to nalthus and the it land might of also colors be navani i can't remember the concept being that color is a, another key aspect that exists here, but we are dealing with something even more primary than the brilliant color. This is invested light. I really love that honor and odium combined make war light. I just, I love that description of like the light surging in rage and then also falling still and peaceful like, you know, a, a global timeline would show periods of war and then periods of peace and then periods of war and then periods of peace. Yes, it certainly is the song that you would imagine playing at a football game or some type of sports match where there are just bursts of, you know, <laughs> excitement and energy followed by two minute TV timeout. <laughs> When we most directly get to experience war light, it is wrapped up with all of these different connotations and connections. And of course, it's 
also leads into anti-light, which we'll uh, talk about. But I think that tower light is actually the one that is most significant going forward and is the combination that Navani was most interested in. Yeah. And I mean, it's the thing that sort of unlocks all of this. It's the first hybrid light that we hear about. And it is called tower light because it is the light produced by the sibling who is the tower, who is the child of honor and cultivation. Her birth is also wrapped up with supposed to be able to be used as a weapon or at least a safe harbor from Odium. Like she was birthed in order to help win the fight against Odium. Yeah, the sibling does say that they were created to be, quote, the common ground between humans and Spren, end quote. Which makes me think of like, the world in Legend of Korra, the sequel to yeah. Avatar The Last Airbender. But basically, she like combines the spirit realm and the real world. And so then you have just like cities where crazy spirits are flying around and like having normal spirit lives. I often wonder if that will be the future of Rashar, if like Shadesmar and the physical realm will become much more interwoven and you'll just have Spren and humans living in harmony together we do know that when dalinar recharges spheres and opens up his connection we know that other people navani namely can see into the cognitive realm and so i wonder if now as bondsmith of the tower will that kind of be the impact when Navani is recharging or maybe she can open up a kind of uh, a world where both of the worlds are crashing up against one another and maybe the real forms of the spren will be more apparent and more seen when you are at the tower. Yeah, it's a bit weird like we've said about the sibling before because it is a hybrid thing it is the child of both honor and cultivation and it's kind of like in this strange gray area it creates its own tower light and it's unclear if that light is like able to be accessed or used anywhere else it presents as a teal or turquoise color as as you would expect combining blue and green let's read a little bit about the the harmony or the the sound quote The two snapped into harmony, the boundless energy of cultivation, always growing and changing, and the calm solidity of honor, organized, structured. They vibrated together, structure and nature, knowledge and wonder, mixing, the song of science itself, end quote. So my question is, Tower Light is obviously a name that they have given it because it comes from Urithiru, the tower. But I feel it should have a name more similar to Warlight that speaks more to its, like, intent or, um, you know, something a little bit more philosophical rather than so literal. And this quote makes me think that a more accurate name for this light would be Science Light or the Rhythm of Science. And since it is the discoveries going on inside the tower uh, that are, you know, following the scientific method. I feel like that is apropos. It's a good, uh, I don't think it's going to become part of the canon. However, it'll be our head canon. I think it might be. I think it might be. Well, let (laughs) let the fans decide on that one. Yeah, tell me what you think about science light. This obviously also brings up the question of a hybrid between cultivation and and odium or cultivodium light and when it comes to the in-world creation of this cultivation odium light we do see this from venley and she sings the combination yeah she doesn't actually produce the light as far as we see but she does succeed at a harmony between Odium and Cultivation's songs or rhythms. 
And while it doesn't create a light, it does seem to aid or enhance her ability to manipulate stone, her surge binding. Yeah, which I thought was really interesting. I will put a pin in this, but it, to me, exemplifies the difference between light and sound, which are the same thing, like you mentioned, the wavelength. But again, let's put a pin in this. Light and sound, I think there's the key difference. She doesn't actually produce the light, but she does make the sound correctly. Let's read this quote from her when it happens. I do think it's important, but it is a long one. It's long, yeah, and we can always break in between to pull out the interesting things. Quote, It felt wrong to be using his light to practice her surge binding, but the stones whispered that all was well. Odium and his tone had become part of Rashar, as cultivation and honor, who had not been created alongside the planet, had become a part of it. His power was natural, and no more wrong or right than any other part of nature. Venley searched for something else, the tone of cultivation. Odium's song could suffuse her, fueling her powers and inflaming her emotions. But that tone, that tone had belonged to her people long before he'd arrived. Let's pause here and just say, wow, <laughs> we got a lot of information <laughs> in just that small part. One, we find out that Odium is a pure tone of Rashar. You know, he is legit, as one could say. As natural as any other part of nature, including honor and cultivation and everything that stems from them. Yeah, we're so used to thinking about Odium, like you said, as the interloper. Yes, um, the invader. Yeah, the invader. But this quote just goes to show that he's just as much a part of this planet as the two that we think of as the real quote unquote shards of Rashar. We also get the knowledge that while Odium's tone is now the main one that the singers are exposed to and interacting with, it is actually Cultivation's tone that they are more familiar with on the longer timeline. So we could imagine that it was cultivation who was their god or at least the earth of rashar mm -hmm. was their god before odium came in yeah i think it's interesting that she sort of favors cultivation here and not honor um i like that cultivation kind of gets a little moment in the sun her importance is highlighted here she's been in the background for so long i also love that we get the information that uh, holding void light inflames emotions in a similar way that holding storm light causes people to want to act. And move. To, yeah, to move forward physically. Um, void light uh, does that to your emotions. So interesting. And kind of sounds like another magic system yeah, that so we know of that we'll talk more about in a future episode. Back to our quote. Quote, they hadn't merely rejected the singer gods, they'd rejected the conflict. Holding to family, singing to love despite their dull forms, they'd left the war and gone a new way. The tone snapped into her mind, cultivation and odium mixing into a harmony, and it thrummed through Venley. She opened her eyes as power spread from her through the stones. They began to shake and vibrate to the sound of her rhythm, liquid, forming peaks and valleys in time with the music. The floor, ceiling, and walls before her rippled, and a trail of people formed from the stone, moving, alive again, as they strode away from pain and war and killing. Freedom. The stones whispered to her of freedom. Rock seemed so stable, so unchangeable, but if you saw it on the timescale of Spren, it was always changing, deliberately, over centuries, end quote. So my question slash theory slash takeaway from this is that a potential name for a cultivodium light or a rhythm of cultivation and odium might be the rhythm of freedom. Which I love. If we have this concept of honor and odium combining for war, 
then cultivation and odium combining for freedom, it really, to me, kind of lines up and makes sense and reflects so much about, as Venley is pointing out, her own people's history and how these two different groups, humans and singers, are fighting and what she wants and what her people want is something different. Yeah, the listeners kind of took the middle path or the third yeah. way. And that is the path that she continues to seek at the end of this book as well when she arrives in new Natanatan and finds some of her people there. I love this concept I, as another combination, but when approached from the Venley perspective, it begins at the most base with sound, with rhythm. And that's where I feel like the introduction of the the listener, the singer, the fused, the regal, all of their different perspectives is really important to start incorporating into our broader perspective of Rashar. Like it's been so human centric and even mm -hmm. before that Alethi centric. Yeah. But we need to really start imagining all of these different people as supremely complex with all their own backstories and histories. And I think that in a Cosmere that I imagine, Rashar could eventually be like the stomping grounds for everyone. Like It's every the New York City of yes, the Cosmere. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's the planet that never sleeps. <laughs> the ultimate mixing pot forced to be extra mixed up by the high storms that come around and just knock everyone around. <laughs> to your point, though, about uh, sort of the, the baseline of sound, rhythm, tone, light not only has a corresponding tone and rhythm, but it can be manipulated by sound and rhythm. This is one of the most important discoveries that the humans make uh, with the assistance of Relaine at Erythiru. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways that this particular enlightenment comes to the humans. It sort of seeps up from a bunch of different places and comes into our awareness. Actually, that's how most enlightenments work. Yeah. yeah. And... So what I love is this discovery that a combination of light from spheres and music and rhythms is can be used to make plants grow better. And this is seen with uh, Relaine, who's just out kind of in the gardens, helping the humans beat on the drums to either attract life spren. There's a there's a weird thing that I don't quite understand about the process of why the plants are growing more, but basically the light, the music are both there and the result is greater production from their crops, which they need and they know that Erythiru had previously. I wonder if tower light will actually be better suited for that application. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. Um, we also get this revelation with Navani and some of the Thalen artifabrians. Navani sort of forces them to reveal some of their fabrial making secrets, which include uh, tuning forks that they use to manipulate stormlight within gemstones and create different fabrials. And then Obviously, we get a lot more of this with Navani and Raboniel, but I think you're right to say that the sound component comes before the light component. Like, we think about light as being the thing, the investiture, but I think that sound came first. I definitely agree. Let's go through some of the quotes and then I'll finale with my thoughts on sound first or sound up kind of <laughs> quote 
I have heard, Rabaniel said, that the lights respond to sound because it is reminiscent of the voice of the shards commanding them to obey, end quote. That's a huge deal for a couple of reasons. One, commands. A key part of the Nalthian magic system yep. is commands. We also know that Don shards have a intent and command from Risen and what we hear from her is very similar to some of the other phrases or command, uh, not pure commands that we know, but things that could be commands. For example, Dalinar, unite them. Kelsier, survive. survive. Like those type of simple one word or couple of words that it's a command. And I think we really need to start seeing the Nalthian system as a great template yeah. or blueprint for how all the rest of the magic systems work. 100%. Another quote, quote, void light and stormlight. Navani said. The voices of gods, or perhaps something older than that. The reason the beings called gods spoke the way they did, end quote. Ah, this is so cool. So it's kind of a chicken or an egg situation here. But I think what the hints are point us in the direction that sound, at least on Rashar, is the primary thing. That it may have predated the shards. Certainly the tone predated Odium, as we just heard from Benly. But the sounds and the rhythms may have also predated Honor and Cultivation. Right. It could be an Adenalsium thing. And I think that we know for a fact that Low-level spren, the kind of natural world spren, existed on Rashar before all of the shards. Yes, those are Adenalsium spren. Yes, and I think that this is where we can kind of understand that everything is making sound. Everything is having that wavelength that's giving off, you know, representing something as simple as motion all the way up to something as complicated as like striking a key that plays, you know, long hair from a horse or something and just vibrates that. But we have these great examples that the rhythms and the tones that the natural world is producing are where investiture first started leaking out from the spiritual realm through the rhythms, through the sounds, through the tones, and into the physical world. And for whatever reason, I think obviously because of Rishadium, uh, but for whatever reason, there is this Risharian focus on sound where on Nalthus it's coming through in color, and Scadrail it's metals. I almost wonder though if like all shards are emitting a sound or a rhythm even on different planets and that sound is like rearranging molecules, atoms, axi, as Raboniel calls them, which then like creates steel, which is, you know, investiture in a way. Could sound be the most basic? Yeah. Yes. I think that that is possible cosmere wide i think it's 100 percent on rashar obviously but i think the good evidence for why that's cosmere wide is that it is primarily seen on rashar which we know existed before <laughs> all of the other shards so it's like the most natural state almost and that's kind of how i think of the importance of sound is it's the like the most natural state for how you could create magic i this is kind yeah. of like a philosophical i mean i take. think uh, well i think in world there is a a like ancient myth or creation story of honor and cultivation singing to create the world obviously rishar was actually there before them but i think that idea of their songs coming to rishar and the vibrations and wavelengths that come from that uh, molding and manipulating the world. I think that there is something to that. And then 
you know, obviously that also makes you think of the Dawn Cities and the Shattered Plains and things that could have been created by vibrations of that scale. Yes, I think the more complex the magic or the more like massive the magic, the more you have to go to the most base. And so when it comes to cymatics, creating all of these gigantic cities or the tower itself, you are because it's such a big project, you are going to need to use the most like readily available power, not power source, because it's not a source of power, it's a conduit actually. Uh, yes. And like the light, this capital L light is a conduit for the tones and the rhythms, but it, the light itself is not emitting those tones. Yes. Quote, you think it doesn't emit the rhythm itself. Rabaniel said. But echoes it, picks it up, end quote. Essentially, Navani discovers that the sound kind of acts as a magnet for the power or the light. And she does a lot of experiments around sort of a magnet-like theory of investiture slash sound waves in that light has a polarity in a sense, which then leads her to the discovery of anti-light. Yes, because we have the transfer of light and the movement of light that is actually started by sound, those tuning forks. And by holding up a tuning fork, you know, struck at a certain tone, you can, like you said, magnetize or, or like a magnet. It is attracted to that. And then you can draw it over to a sphere and this is the secret that the thalans uh, use and unveil to transfer light between all of their spheres and that's like the human way to do it with a tool but of course by the end of the book we have raboniel being able to sing the tone in order to move light from one place to another and navani even learns to do that, which is super cool. There's also the, you know, sort of quote unquote normal method that the Alethes use called the Arnest method, which does something with pressure differentials to move light. That's another thing that my not physics minded brain doesn't like quite understand. This one is important though, because this is the more, uh, I consider it the adhesion line, which will just, oh, adhesion is important, people. The pressure differential that is demonstrated on the small scale with moving light between gemstones is the exact same thing that, A, allows for the surge adhesion to work, and B, is the thing that allows Teravangian to ascend into mm, the power of Odium. That's a great he connection. sucks the, well, not he, Nightblood removes all of the power connected to Rasa and the vessel, and there is a vacuum that is created by that. Teravangian is the closest thing around and is therefore sucked in in the exact same way that light is moved in the Arnest method. Gold star for you. Thank you. <laughs> Unfortunately, the points are made up just like on whose line, and they mean nothing. I think a an important thing to note here is that if light is not given that path that is sort of drawn by the sound, or it doesn't have sort of a purpose it's not doing anything it just evaporates outside of the gemstone just like you know if kaladin's holding stormlight and he opens his mouth and exhales it all just goes away he can't just like suck it back in again i think this is really important when it comes to those commands and maybe what we think commands apply to you know when vasher creates a little moppet mm -hmm. it could also apply to the dawn shards maybe even the shards themselves yeah. everything oh. having a command and an intent and needing that or just like the power kind of evaporating or like just being able to be stored right just like breath like breath is either 
doing something because you've used it to command or it's held inside of an object, just like Stormlight. Yeah, I certainly think we are going to see a lot more of Stormlight as batteries or that's like <laughs> storm, Stormlight gems. Yeah, as, spheres. Yes, as batteries of the Cosmere. But the question then is, what is lost or what is necessary for this system to be as efficient as hmm. possible? And we kind of... Well, okay, but then like if Vasher put some breaths in a shirt, can Kaladin draw it out and use it like Stormlight? Because they're both in Vasher? No, but the reverse is true. We know that hmm. Vasher is on Rashar because he can use Stormlight to stay alive. Mm-hmm. And... That's better than killing people for their breaths or yeah. turning them into drabs. Yeah. So I don't think that I, I that's why I think like stormlight gemstones are the battery that everyone else wants to use and wants to be able to have access to because other things are like locked geographically or inside of someone's breath. Uh, yeah, but I still think I wonder if there's a word of Brandon about it, like if Kaladin could use breath to power his lashings i don't know if there's been a specific word of brandon and maybe someone could point that out if you have seen that but i do know that the reverse is true and yeah, from for what sure we've learned in rhythm of war about marais and kind of thydekar it definitely seems like everybody else also wants the gemstones filled with stormlight it's just so easily accessible but it needs something. It needs intent. As you just talked about, the, without a direction, without an intent, the light and power will evaporate outside of a gemstone. But we also know that the creation of hybrid lights and anti-light has to be done with a specific intent. So incredible. This is one of the biggest reveals, if not the biggest reveal in this whole research scenario Navani cannot create anti-light without specifically intending to create anti-light. And that's because she realizes that, okay, well, we have to start at the beginning here. I'm getting way ahead of myself. <laughs> First, we learn that there even is anti-light. And that's like a theory that Raboniel brings to Navani. Yeah. And that's, again, starting with the learn from the sounds and move up the hierarchy. That's how they make that discovery of anti-light. Well, yeah, Navani does. She, because they start, they actually, they start too high up. They yes, start with, with the light. Yeah. Thinking, Rabaniel thinks that stormlight and void light are opposites, which is not true. And Navani has to break it all the way down to the base, the sound, to figure this out and she sort of goes through all of the levels she goes from light to music starts getting into music theory and then she goes all the way down to math and figures out that music is basically math and that there are you know different numbers associated with the specific frequencies and wavelengths of sound that make music quote the opposite of most numbers was a negative number could a tone be negative? Could there be a negative wavelength? Many such ideas couldn't exist in the real world, like negative numbers were an artificial construct. But those peaks and troughs, could she make a tone that produced the opposite pattern? Peaks where there were troughs and troughs where there were peaks? During her feverish study into sound theory, she discovered the answer to this. A wave could be negated, its opposite created and presented in a way that nullified the original, canceling it out. They called it destructive interference. Strangely, the theories said that a sound and its opposite sounded exactly the same. End quote. As you said, probably one of the most important discoveries is this creation of antilight and the understanding that these different things these different powers, these different invested capital L lights have a opposite that is supremely destructive. <laughs> that is a main way that it's been used so far is just lots of blowing things up 
and occasionally sucking out the souls of your daughter. (laughs) But importantly, this revelation that the sound and its opposite are exactly the same means that the only thing differentiating them is the intent. You have to actually be like, hold it in your mind, just like we were talking about with Nalthus and awakening. You have to hold it in your mind that the thing that you are trying to do is to create anti-void light or anti-storm light because otherwise it's just the same. And interestingly, anti-light tones actually sound identical as you would expect, but any being that is infused with that light hears it awfully. It sounds terrible. So like anti-void light to Navani sounds just the same as the regular void light tone, but to Raboniel, it sounds like this horrible discordant noise that like makes their skin raise. The full implications of what this discovery means are not quite understood. Certainly, we get very little with anti-light. It is similar in our own world to some of the theories about antimatter and how if you were to combine any form of matter with its exact opposite, you would get lots and lots of explosions. Some people have theorized that you can use this amount of force to like create a black hole, and it's one of the things that may be created like when stars collapse as there's a bunch of antimatter created but we can't see the antimatter but it's there in the universe because of xyz that's interesting because anti-light in spheres reminds me of a black hole the way that they're described yeah they say it definitely sucking light light in almost but it also kind of gives off light it is a weird thing but does kind of line up with real world black holes in that they have a event horizon yeah that would actually look light and you would be able to see the light Uh as maybe you have seen in some artistic renderings of what black holes look like but the actual black hole itself and then certainly the singularity at the center is not anything that you can see that's where the blackness comes from but right at the edge there's where the blackness isn't anymore and that's actually (laughs) light you would you would it would emit something way more radiation and Mm. that has its own Mm -hmm. kind of things that um, may or may not impact the Cosmere. But I think... Anti-void light spheres are mini black holes. There's definitely a lot of power inside of them. And this is really one of the questions that Rhythm of War hints at. Specifically, though, I believe it's talking about Venli's power of cohesion And the, yeah, we will talk a lot more about the theories of what our powers could be when they are not restricted by the bonds and oaths of the spread and of honor and of cultivation. But I think there's still a lot that is going to happen with the invention of both anti-void light and anti-storm light. I'm just thinking, obviously, you're going to make a grenade. Right, you're gonna the find most powerful. Yeah, you're gonna ever. you're gonna find some way because this explosion really only happens when they are uh, confined or under pressure. So they're gonna find a way to put stormlight and anti-stormlight, let's say, inside of a gemstone, but partitioned by aluminum, mm-hmm. probably. And then you have a way of removing that aluminum. You know, you pull the pin out, throw it, and then when they combine, explode. Yes. Oh man, it's going to be like World War I. You're just going to have all of this destruct- destructive technology. So many people are going to die. It's going to be this horrific thing. Ugh. There is an unfortunate aspect of World War I that Rashar feels like it is on the edge of, except with powers that are vastly more <laughs> than anything. It's basically like if people were as dumb as they were here on Earth in World War I, but they had the destructive power that we humans now have today (laughs) with like thousands upon thousands of nukes those all would have just been dropped everywhere like turkey sure why not don't need that anymore nuke it russia eh, not that great nuke it japan 
barely in World War One. Just kidding, they did a bunch of stuff. But nuke it. It would have just been nonsense left and right all over the planet. That's what is conceivably possible. You have these weapons of mass destruction, if you want to call them that, that are in the hands or could be in the hands of almost everyone. They're not quite to that level yet. I just said a grenade. A grenade is a far cry from a nuclear weapon. Unfortunately, though, you have people like L showing up at the very end. Oh, man. Who Elle are is very, creepy. very clearly just like, yeah, I'm going to kill everyone. Like they did. They got a real psycho vibe of just like, if you introduce the idea of a grenade, he's going to be saying, let's make that 10 times bigger and drop it on as many people as we can. Oh, you have biological weapons that are also hinted at by Rabaniel. And there's this weird plague that's coming out the West on oh, Rashar. Yeah. There's a lot of different World War One aspects all going on on Rashar. It's probably going to get a little darker before it gets brighter. <laughs> Just to talk a tiny bit more, because we briefly referenced cymatics, and we get additional information in Rhythm of War that back up the little that we already know of cymatics on Rashar, because part of Navani's experiments is with sand, white sand, some might say, <laughs> um, and the the tones, the pure tones, create a specific patterns in the sand so just kind of going back to that idea of the tones potentially creating things like the shattered planes and stuff i think that there is some additional backup for that theory i love that cymatics is not only coming back into the story but is foundational to the story it was such a cool concept when it was pitched by capsule all but like many really years ago. so brief yes, you know it was it was a small thing it was like part so of his small fake flirtation with shallan <laughs> yeah and oh man shallan feels so young in that and i'm just like how many years ago was that <laughs> very weird way that time moves me now but i obviously believe now with so much of the information that we have gotten about how sounds work about how the singers themselves are infused like they evolved with sound as their mm, primary thing yeah that the t these tones have existed on rashar and that they may be manifesting as like pockets of power and you know pockets of adenalsium's original power throughout the cosmere i love the idea that honor and cultivation would have shown up and been singing their songs and creating the cities i think it is a beautiful image of the creation story of any planet oh so beautiful obviously they're not having a great time at the moment one of those is dead <laughs> there's an invader who's now kind of like not an invader anymore <laughs> i think it's a great story example and it's a way of exploring the importance of sound and music in a way that i've never seen before but I also love music as the thing that is most easily mixed and match. Like Navani makes mm. this whole big discovery about how tones have their opposites and X, Y, Z. But in our real world, we know that music is always made better by the mashup. Like every <laughs> single generation, every single style of music is the combination of things that existed previously. Yeah. And so yeah, you have yeah. like jazz music created in the 1920s and a little rock bit and roll rock and roll you have this again and again different influences different inspirations different people and maybe sometimes just one person comes along and is like you know i'm gonna play johnny be good on this electric guitar and just melt everyone's brain <laughs> but the it's always been combining it's the thing that's most easy to combine you say something i say something there's code switching which is when humans will just like naturally pick up on how all the other humans are talking and they'll just immediately switch in so if you go to a southern town you'll develop a southern accent instinctively automatically and without <laughs> thinking about it consciously i think there is some variation there but yeah sound as like a really fundamental way that we connect to each other yes yeah and and in particular i would say you obviously we talk to each other and relate that way but uh 
sound and music and singing, like humans singing together is such an ancient yeah it's kind of a big deal thing yeah like we that is something that we have been doing for as long centuries. as we know. Yeah. yeah like as long as there have been humans we have been singing together and if you are a singer if you are a person like myself who has been a part of choirs and choruses of you know a big group of humans all singing together in harmony there is something truly truly magical and tangible yeah. about that. It's when you give it intent. You give sound intent and it becomes this powerful thing that you're talking about. And you can make people cry and you can yeah. make people cheer and jump and scream and, you know, have every possible emotion. And with sound waves like being a literal physical thing, not only do you impact people emotionally like that, but physically. Yeah. It's always shocking when uh like for example you hear the beat of a particularly low drum mm -hmm. and the literal force of that sound wave causes you to catch your breath like it affects you physically which is just crazy like we've been talking about this whole time all of these things that are invisible to the naked eye and yet have so much power to take it from the big picture full cosmere shard songs i want to zoom all the way down to the individual level because there are a couple of individuals we see in rhythm of war who have their own specific rhythm like raboniel has her Rabaniel own song yeah raboniel song which i just thought was really cool and then we hear uh, that L also, it sounds like, used to have his own rhythm as well that was taken away from him by Odium. Like a punishment. Yeah, and given to Moash, but that's a whole other story. To me, this is interesting because, okay, Odium's been around long enough, so he can be a pure tone over Shar and very natural. And then people maybe only type two invested entities like what's the cutoff is it any person or is it only these beans like raboniel and l mm. that have really also collected something else on top of just being normal like they are See, centers so... of power and is that what the longer power coalesces the mm. more likely it is to create a rhythm when you're on rashar to my mind i my impression was that odium had given mm. specific individuals their own rhythm like he i don't know if he created it for them or just like assigned it to them or something that was my impression but then like that begs a lot of questions also about how exactly does that work i'm a little bit more worried slash focus slash terrified about <laughs> what harmony said about what happens to power when it's left untethered or unconnected uh -huh. so if our Rabaniel and our L, these high regals, are over millennia just gathering more and more power. It's like gravity, and maybe that there is a gravity to the sound waves as well. And so that eventually, with enough gravity, a new rhythm will be created. Are they power. gathering power? Not necessarily gathering power in the traditional way. I'm saying like the weight of their existence mm. and the way that it keeps happening and keeps maintaining yeah just is, their persistence yes it's unnatural and so that is acting like a gravity well mm -hmm. and interesting thought i i really love the idea that when it comes to sound it's very natural maybe odium can take it away but the i feel like the rhythms kind of come more out of the experience yeah. and the natural world agree agree that's why i was kind of like Mm -hmm. weirded out by the idea that odium would be like granting them to people that didn't seem to fit to me that was they just do my all impression cool names though and those seem like they were given <laughs> <laughs> this also brings us to the question of like one of our friends was <laughs> kind of upset and was like how am i supposed to believe that navani all of a sudden is just able to perfectly 
sing one of the pure tones of Rochard basically without trying and no musical experience. <laughs> the Mary Sue Navani. <laughs> However, I think that th- that part of Navani's story is a really important flag in a way that shows us some implications of how the story of humans on Rashar is going to develop. Just like Odium was not an original, quote unquote, Rashar and Shard, but has been there long enough to become one of the pure tones of Rashar. Humans, obviously, not native to Rashar, but they've been there for long enough now yeah. that they are. Now, they have become Rasharan. Let's go to the quote here. Quote, humans could sing the correct tones. Humans could hear the music of Rashar. Her ancestors might have been aliens to this world, but she was its child. End quote. Yes. And that just piggybacks on Rolaine's observation from previous books that Sometimes it seems like humans can sort of instinctively feel the rhythms and yeah. that they they sync up unknowingly and they just haven't had the knowledge or the training to like tune into them. So I'm wondering if this part of Novani's story is going to lead to more humans, you know, kind of a an intersection of humans and singers. I certainly love the idea of the humans and singers coming together because it seems like the only way out that one of them doesn't get completely destroyed. (laughs) What I think is great about this realization is that concept that the humans were aliens but no longer are. Humans are Risharian now. There is no separation between the humans and Rishar in the same way that Odium is now Risharium. And I think that that says something important and significant, but also kind of leans into my theory of like, the longer you're around, the more weight that you collect, the more the gravity is impacting you. Because it's just like, they've, the humans have been around long enough to be Risharian. They've, they've. Well, yeah. I mean, I think it has to do with your spirit web. Cause if you are, born on Rashar, you know, that is written into your spirit web as part of that's your a, identity. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. And the over time, the spirit web would become more solidified. Right. Yeah, just First, you would be strengthens. like, yeah, I definitely think that that is a secret case when it comes to the spirit web. It's always like, oh, yeah, the spirit web exists. <laughs> I know that has been a bunch. It was much like the Rhythm of War, just a download so of much information. information. We hope that you are enjoying. Find us on Reddit, Twitter, Facebook, all the different places. Yeah, I would love to hear specifically what you think about Science Light and what you think the Cultivodium Light would be called. I've also really been enjoying doing a thought experiment of like, what if a different shard came to Rashar? What would their song be called? So... You can hit me up with those ideas, too. Just throw them out. We are out there. You're out there. Throw us your ideas. We love them. Bunch of episodes will be coming up all focused on Rhythm of War and the different things that we learned. Some of them are going to be much more topic and research-based. Some of them will be more plot-based or character-based. We're just going to really just go with the flow or go with the sound. (laughs) go with the rhythm there we go we have a new segment that we'll end each episode with and this is called the stormlight archive explained badly you are also welcome to leave us your version of stormlight archives explained badly but this has been making the rounds on many of the threads and so this one is from Derek jones the stormlight archive explained badly Hateful dude makes ghosts torture zombies in between apocalypses. Also, everyone has a secret agenda and or chronic issues. And that might have been badly, (laughs) but it was also great. (laughs) Until next time. Life before death. Strength before weakness. Journey before destination. 